Um, this is Dan Gaspar. Um, Dan and I met about a year ago um, in a camp that he came out here to run in Utah, and we've just kind of been staying con connected um, since then. Um, but I reached out to Dan to have him come on and talk about goalkeeper mentality today. And the reason being is because you can kind of see behind him a little bit. Um, he has uh, more experience than any goalkeeper coach I know. He's worked with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Portugal national team, um, Iranian national team at the World Cup. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Benfica and Porto, both in Portugal. Um, US 18 um, men's national team as well. And I'm sure there's probably the list just keeps going outside of that. Um, but Dan has a, a massive background in the goalkeeping position. If you uh, connect with any goalkeeper coaches around the nation, all of them will know his name. Um, and we'll consider him basically a goalkeeping legend in, in this, this realm and sphere of, of space. So, Dan, we appreciate you coming on and talking with us today. I'm only a legend because of the white hair, silver hair that I have. <laughs> I, if I didn't have the silver hair, I would be in a – well, everybody, give me a thumbs up. Come on. Everybody's thumbs up. Two thumbs up because we catch the ball with two hands. Come on. Yeah, there you go. go. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Brennan, for the uh, invitation. I, I appreciate it. Anytime um, that I get an opportunity to, to speak to a collection of goalkeepers um, just brings a lot, of, a lot of joy to me. You had wanted me to um, share uh, my thoughts on, on mentality, and it's not necessarily specifically with goalkeeping mentality, but just principles and values that I've learned and developed over the years of, uh, of my uh, goalkeeping coaching uh, career. Um, I'd like to start off with just a, a quick story, and it's not a goalkeeper, but probably uh, certain most people know um, Cristiano Ronaldo. I was with the Portuguese national team, and in 2010 we were in the World Cup South Africa. And um, Ronaldo and I were in the steam room, and I decided let me ask him some questions since we're one on one um, to try to get a better understanding of his mentality. And I asked him, you know, what motivates you? And he goes, well, winning. I said, but you've won everything. What really motivates you? And he goes, I want to be the best. I want to be the best of all times. I want to be the best in history. So how many athletes do you know that make such a statement that they want to be the best in history and they want to be the best of all times? And then he went on and shared some other things with me. And it's, we all love to win. Um, but how many of us really hate to lose? And he's one of these athletes that hates to lose in everything, guys. Yeah. You, know, you know who the best ping pong player is on the Portuguese national team? It's Ronaldo. You want to know who the best foosball player is on, on the national team? It's Ronaldo. Anything that involves competition, uh, he's the best at. So he loves to play like we all love to play. But more importantly to him, he, he enjoys and thrives on competing. If you were to ask Ronaldo when the World Cup is, and if I ask you guys, hey, when's the World Cup? You'd probably give me a, a date in a year. But for someone like Ronaldo, every day is the World Cup, guys. Every day that he crosses that line and he steps on the pitch, he's there to give the very best that he possibly can. So he has that world man cup mentality every minute, every day, every week, every month of the year. He's what we refer to, guys, as the one percenters. And what do I mean by that? 99% of the athletes that we train, they show up. You can see them. They're there physically. But those who truly become the best that they can be, who become great, who become champions, they bring much more than that. And that's the challenge that I have for all of you. The next time that you train, whether it's with yourself alone or whether it's with Coach Gilliam or with your team, also bring your best friend, which is your brain. You want to learn every word, every activity. You want to be a sponge. You want to grasp it all in. It's still not good enough. You want to bring your body. You want to bring your brain 
but you also want to bring your heart and soul because you love what you do. If you bring those three things to training on a regular basis, and we're human beings, we're not robots, and each day might be a little bit different than others, but try to bring your body, your mind, and your soul, and your growth will accelerate, will soar like you wouldn't imagine. It's just unbelievable. Um, the other thing I want to share with you is if I asked you what's inside a soccer ball, you'd give me the standard answer that most people give and they say well you know air or bladder but for me it's much more than that for me inside that ball is the hopes dreams and aspirations anything that i hope to achieve from the game anything that i hope to attain from the game is inside that soccer ball and i treat that ball with respect i love that ball it's one of my best friends it's an extension of my personality you know, I've worked overseas, I worked on four continents, I worked all over the world. We're blessed to be here in the United States of, of America. We lose a ball. What happens when you lose a ball? More than likely, your parents go out and buy another one. And if you lose that one, more than likely, your coach provides you another one. Overseas, it's not that simple. You lose a ball, guess what? You might be without a ball for a really long time. So they hunt that ball down. They find it, they, they clean it, they sleep with it. It's, it means everything to them. The best players in the world, whether you're a field player or you're a goalkeeper, that ball is an extension of your, relation, extension of your personality. And if you have a good relationship with the ball, it's because you're training with the ball, you're playing with the ball. The other thing I want to share with you before I take any, any questions is, hey, listen, you know, uh, these are crazy times. It's like a fiction movie, except it's real. It's really happening. Um, you have a choice and how you want to cope with this environment, with this scenario, with this unprecedented, uh, uncertain times. I know for me, I can share with you what I'm trying to do. Number one, I'm trying to reflect and analyze on my coaching philosophy, sitting down and really fine-tuning that. Number two, I'm also trying to, with attention to detail, set my goals, my short-term goals and my long-term goals. My short-term goals, you know, those are immediate grat gratification. The long-term goals, they take longer and require patience and discipline and accountability, but the rewards are immense. You want your goals to focus on performance goals, not outcome goals, because you can't control that. Um, you want to be supported by the people that are in your life who love you, who care for you, your family, your friends. But you also want those professionals, like a Coach Gilliam, who's going to nurture you and guide you and who's been there and who's done it to help you along that pathway of, of success. You need to recognize the obstacles that you're going to have to overcome and how are you going to overcome those obstacles. Ask yourself, why do I love the game of soccer? Why have I chosen to be a goalkeeper? What is it about goalkeeping that I like? What are my major strengths? What are my major challenges? What are my shortcomings? What are the areas that I need to improve on? And this doesn't all happen in five or 10 minutes or one day or one week. If you really do the process right and the rewards are great, you have to take time. And, you know, and really focus on what you're trying to achieve. The other thing and the last thing I want to share with you is, is gratitude. You know, as much as I hate this CV-19, it's COVID-19, it's really brought in some benefits to me, how much I miss the game, how much I miss training goalkeepers, how much I miss the smell of the grass, and in and, and, and the bright sunshine. I love it more than I ever thought I did, and I'm so extremely grateful uh, that I have something in my life that I love. Don't make the ma same mistake I made, guys. And the mistake that I made is I was always too busy to send that email 
I was always too busy to pick up the phone. I was always too busy to write a letter to people who impacted my life, who without them, I wouldn't be where I am today. People that I was surrounded by, who loved me, cared for me, shared their wisdom and knowledge and experience with me, who gave me opportunities to learn and grow. I was always too busy. But because we're in lockdown, I made that phone call to a person that was very dear to me, who was there in my life when I needed him. And I called his home and his wife answered the phone. She was so happy to hear from me. And I asked if Tony was home. And there was a pause, there was a silence, and then she asked me, and then she told me, you haven't heard, Dan. I said, no. Tony passed away two weeks ago. <clears throat> that was really hard. The guilt that I felt, the pain that I felt, the shame that I felt, was hard. Don't make the same mistake I made. Make the call. Send the email. Write a letter. That's it, Brennan. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that has always stood out to me about you is, you, and you, you just spoke a lot about it, but the fact that you have such a passion and love, right? Everything that you're talking about is, do you love what you do? Do you love your actions? Do you love who you are? Um, and that mentality is, is a difficult one to keep um, as a central focus as we strive to achieve goals, right? We, we get caught up in the numbers and the things that we could do. Um, so thank you for those, those messages. Um, goalkeepers, so we're going to open it up to you guys now for questions um, across the board. We want to try to keep it along the lines of uh, the mental aspect of a goalkeeper uh, for this session. Um, if you have any personal questions for Dan as far as some of his, his experiences at World Cups, uh, that would be awesome as well. Um, but go for it. Um, unmute yourself. Throw out a question. You guys should should have plenty. So. We'll give the next little bit for you guys. Don't be shy. Step up. There's always a pause during this time. I understand. Uh, I got one. Okay, so... Um, What's your name? I'm, I'm Kayla. How I'm old are you? How old are you? I'm 12. Okay. Um, so... How do you like shake off a goal like once you get score on like how do you re like find your mental stage again? That's an awesome that's an awesome question. And it's something no matter how great you're going to be as a goalkeeper, one thing that I can guarantee you did you say Caleb? Caleb. Okay. Caleb. <laughs> say it again, bud. Caleb. Okay. okay, okay. So, no matter how good of a goalkeeper you're going to be, one thing I know for sure that I can guarantee you, you will concede goals. That, that walk that we cross the goal line to pick the ball at the end of the net, it's really short, isn't it? But it feels like it takes forever. It seems like an eternity. And unless you're a goalkeeper, you don't know that feeling of picking the ball at the end of the net. Only us know that. The special, you know, fraternity that we have, sorority that we have. What I'd like to teach is, number one, no matter how much you beat yourself up, no matter how much embarrassment it may cause you, there's one thing for sure that I know. You can't change that. But you have to have a routine in how you're going to deal with conceding those goals like you do anything. If you want to build up your muscles, you go to the gym. You want to build up your mind, you have to practice these routines. And all the great goalkeepers have routines. 
First, you want to control your breathing. Inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth. Inhale that positive energy and exhale that garbage and that waste. Get the ball out of the net as quickly as you can so it gets back into play. You want to have a winner shuffle, meaning you want your shoulders up, your chin up. You want to be light on your feet. You don't want to be sluggish with your shoulders going down, arms by your side, and feet getting heavy. Okay? Um, because then you're not prepared, and the team knows you're not prepared. How many goalkeepers do you know who are good goalkeepers, but as soon as they give up that goal, they're finished for the rest of the game? All right, so we have to have this mental training and bouncing back from conceding that, uh, that goal. So number one, acceptance. Number two, control your breathing. Get the ball out of the net. Start moving around. Learn and grow from that situation, not during the game, but after the game or the next day. Because your team is, is going to require to count on you if you're, if you're ready, okay? What I used to do is I used to pick up some grass. And that was a symbol for me. I controlled my breathing. When I released the grass from my hand, I released the goal from my mind. The other thing that I would suggest you do, whether you're at home or away, is pick a spot. But a spot that's, um, that's never going to move. It's fixed. Okay? And you look at that spot when you concede that goal, and that spot's going to allow you to forgive yourself. It's going to allow you to move on. It's going to allow you to be strong and brave and have uh, the courage to continue to play. That same spot can also work for you if you make a great save. And you look at that spot, and it inspires you. It engages you. You get ignited. So these are some of the mental processes that I think are really important when a goalkeeper concedes the, a goal. Get the ball out of the net, control your breathing, accept the fact you can't change it, um, and, and move on. You could clap your hands, and that releases the goal from your mind. It's all about here. It's all about what's happening on here. Your brain can be your best friend but it can also be your worst enemy. Then also, guys, establish a tradition, a routine, and don't share that spot with Coach Gilliam or your peer. It's yours. It belongs to you. And that's the conversation that you're having while you're playing. When things are going great, it, it gives you more inspiration. When things are not going, going that great, it allows you to bounce back. Does that help you anyway? Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Just going to add a little bit to it, Kaylor. Um, you know, we all in life go through periods of being down, right? You feel that as soon as you get scored on, right? And one in my life, one of the things I've noticed that, that bounces you out of the fastest is thinking about other people rather than thinking about yourself, right? And so if you think about any goal, there's always some type of mistake, and there's somebody who's taking ownership as well outside of yourself. And so if, if while you're getting that ball, you said, okay, my left back made a mistake, he's going to be feeling bad about this and that we just got scored on. You grab that ball, it's out of your net, and now you're talking to your left back, giving him encouragement. So rather than thinking about yourself, now you're thinking about, okay, who else on my team needs my support right now? And as soon as you take it off of yourself, now all of a sudden you're back to work. Um, and that's the unique aspect of a goalkeeper is that, we're there to serve the rest of the players the entire time. And as soon as you can start serving them again and forget about yourself, then you seem to forget about things a lot faster. All right, thank you. Cool, man. Okay, who else? I've got one. Go, Haven. Um, so for my question, it's when you're looking at athletes or goalkeepers that are looking to go to the next level, um, what are some things that catch your eye or do you look at first um, or would be something to focus on and to improve to then catch the eye of others? Yeah. It's a package. You know, oftentimes, you know, goalkeepers are not just assessed on their technical ability. Today's day and age with the quality of training that uh, occurs in the United States uh, through goalkeeper coaches. Most goalkeepers are technically refined, 
Um, but there's other aspects that you have to look at. You know, the emotional, the mental, the physical, the technical, the tactical. Can they make decisions under pressure? You know, do they take accountability and responsibility for their own training? You know, when you're being evaluated and observed, it's right from the moment you step out of your car onto the pitch. Who's carrying your bag? Who's not carrying your bag? Are you carrying your bag? Are you taking responsibility? Are you waiting for the coach to get you to go? Or do you take that responsibility onto yourself and make sure that you have a routine that allows you to be prepared for the demands of the training session and the game? You know, how do you try, how do you dress? How do you project yourself? Your command of your voice, is it simple uh, in terms of uh, with, with um, instructions? Are you a simple, safe, and secure goalkeeper? Young goalkeepers, because they're physically strong and they're fit, they lose a sense of hardcore goalkeeping. The hardcore goalkeeping starts here within yourself and then expands away. What keeps coaches up at night are those goalkeepers who focus out here and neglect in here. 80, 90% of your saves can be executed with the mini shuffle, which is a mini, you know, within your body range. Very few times are you asked to make that world-class save, but we focus for that. How many of us like to dive? How many likes uh, the training of diving sessions and flying sessions and et cetera? We all do. It's spectacular, but you want to be consistent. Consistency is huge. If you save what you're supposed to save, you'll have a very good career. And if you go beyond that, that's great. But don't start away from your body. Start within your body and then work yourself out. So you have the, the footwork. You know, are you a good dancer? Good dancers don't look at their feet. In goalkeeping, we have the art of the dance. And these are footwork maneuvers that are choreographed that require you to have some rhythm. The best goalkeepers in the world, they're in sync with the game. So in other words, and this is at the highest levels. If, I'm, if my goalkeeper is playing against Brazil versus playing against England, it's a whole different mentality. It's a whole different rhythm. You know, you can't have the game being salsa and samba and, you, you know, you're playing hard rock in, in your head. It just doesn't work. With the technical players, you have to be very cautious of the space that you expose behind you. Whereas the most aggressive players, you can attack the ball more, more aggressively. So you need to be a student of the game. You know, during this quarantine lockdown time, I encourage all you guys to watch games, to view games, you know, and learn as you're observing with, with attention to detail, with keen insight uh, on everything, on the way they distribute, on the way they communicate, on the way they position themselves. Being a student of the game. I don't know how many goalkeepers are on this Zoom, but if I was to ask all you guys, tell me what the size of the goal is. Tell me from the goal line to the small box what the distance is. Tell me from the goal line to the penalty spot what it is. Tell me from the goal line to the big box what it is. Give me the width of the big box. And I know if I ask you guys, hey, how many years you've been playing? Some will say three, one, 10, 11. But I'm pretty sure that there's nobody on this Zoom cast that can tell me the specific dimensions of everything that I just said. If I was to ask you if you're in the middle of your goal, how many side steps does it take you to get to the post? If I was to ask you if you're on one post, how many steps does it take you to get on the other spot? If I was to ask you how many power steps it would take to get from one post to the other, could you tell me? Is it important to know? We all agree, yes. You guys are property owners. Your goal is your house. Your goal area is your property. The only difference between me and you is I pay taxes for my home and my property. You're the owner of that, that space. You control that space. Therefore, you need to know with your eyes closed. You need to be the king or the queen of that goal 
and then at that goal area. Your training should involve that space. If I want to be a good swimmer, I'm not going to swim around the pool. If I want to be a good pool player, I'm not going to run around the pool table. I'm going to jump in the pool. I'm going to play pool. You want to be a good goalkeeper? Then master the dimensions of the area that you're responsible for, that you have the privilege to use your hands in. Next. Cool. Okay, who's up next? Um, like, when you're, like, taking, like, a, when someone's taking a PK on you, like, what do you do to get, like, ready? Like, what goes on in, like, your mind? Coach Gillen, you got a very sophisticated group here. <laughs> I've done a number of these, but uh, these are outstanding questions. Okay. When the penalty kick is called against your team and the other team is – is you know setting up to take a shot what does everybody feel on that pitch or people watching that game what what, what are they already assuming that they're going to score that the goal is going to be scored in fact some of them are already celebrating before the goal is even taken right this is the opportunity for you to become that hero this is a psychological warfare that's going to occur the worst thing that you can do is allow that field player to do exactly what they do in training. They get a bag of balls, they put them down, they put the ball on the penalty spot, they take their number of steps, their approach, and then they strike the ball. You want to take them out of their rhythm. And the way to do that is to try to delay as much time as you possibly can. And for that, there's all different ways to do that. Okay? So the longer it takes, for the penalty shooter to take the shot, the more advantageous it is to you. I mean, back in my days, and this is not to be shared with anyone, but I'd have the backup goalkeeper run to me with a second pair of gloves and said, hey, here's your penalty kick gloves. Here's your penalty kick gloves. And the shooter's like freaking out. What? What? You know? And then I'd change my gloves and, you know. Today, the, the rules have changed a little bit. The worst that could happen is I got a yellow card, but I wanted to delay. <laughs> I, wasn't a, I wasn't a tall goalkeeper. I wanted to make myself as big as possible. So I would open up my arms and I would sway back and forth. The other thing I would do is I would hit the uh, post with my elbow and my fist so that that would implant the sound of the ball hitting that post subconsciously to the shooter. The technical aspects of it, if they're a right-footed shooter and they're taking an awkward run to the ball, whether it's a long run or whether it's a severe arcing run, more than likely they're going to go against their natural swing because they want the time to readjust their hips to put it to the opposite direction. Years ago, it used to be, you know, they look at one side and that's the side that they're going to strike to. But field players have gotten much smarter now and they look to one side and shoot to the other. The other thing that I would do is I'd have somebody that I would appoint on my team during warm-ups of a match. Oftentimes, a penalty shooter likes to take a penalty shot before the game starts. So make sure you got your own personal scout out there that – is recording the side to where they're going. So these are some of the, you know, mental aspects and technical aspects uh, that I can share with you. It's a great opportunity for you to be a hero. Don't rush into it. Take time. The longer that you take, it disturbs the rhythm and the routine of the player. If you were a small goalkeeper like me, make yourself big, you know, you could do all kinds of delay tactics, and I'm not going to share any more than the ones that I shared already. Um, and watch the approach of the player. If the approach to the ball is strange, awkward, then more than likely they're going to the opposite side. If it's a normal approach to the ball, more than likely they're going with their natural swing uh, with their leg. Now, again, there's no guarantees, and if I had this – the secret for saving penalty kicks, wow, you know, um, I'd be making millions of dollars, you know. Uh, but those are some of the, uh, the experiences that I wanted to share with you in terms of uh, taking penalties. 
And have you noticed a difference on penalties between like a league season and like a tournament scenario? So say you're in the middle of league and you have a PK in the middle of a game, the pressure that's on the player there compared to the pl pressure that's on a player, say that you're in a tournament final and you're going into PKs. I, I haven't done that analysis, so I can't really give judgment on that. I mean, field players are so sophisticated now that what they're doing while they're approaching to the ball, they're waiting for the goalkeeper to make that commitment. Yeah. And they're so good and so patient and so composed that they wait for that movement. And in, in FIFA now, you have to keep one foot at least on the, on, the, on the line, on your goal line, which makes it even more difficult for the goalkeeper uh, to make the save. But, Brandon, I, I don't know. I haven't, haven't made that analysis. Um, and, again, because of the technology, yeah. field players know that, you know, when a team is preparing against them, the goalkeeper coach is going back and, you know, collecting all the videos that they possibly can on all the penalty kicks that that player has taken, and they try to develop a pattern. When I was coaching overseas, I would try to really analyze the body mechanics of the player who would more than likely take the penalty shot to see if their arms are close to their body or are they open up, to see their head positioning, their hips positioning, to try to give um, the, my goalkeeper some advanced knowledge. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Devin, I want you to think of a question, bud. Um, I'm going to ask one, and then you'll get the next one, okay? Um, so you've worked with a lot of goalkeepers, Dan, and I'm curious, out of all the keepers on the professional side, um, who, which goalkeeper stands out in your mind with the had the most total strength and capabilities, and what were those features? You know, it's, it's a difficult answer, a difficult question to answer. And the reason why I say that is none of them were perfect, mm -hmm. despite their world-class rankings and et cetera. Um, I wish I could take a piece of each one and then mold it all into one goalkeeper, and then I would have that perfect goalkeeper. But I was very fortunate, very blessed to be surrounded by great goalkeepers um, that I trained. Here in the U.S., I, I worked with Tim Howard, uh, you know, who was such an athlete. Uh, it was amazing. He could have played any sport, and luckily for us, he chose to be a, a goalkeeper. I worked with him with the U-17 national team. And Nick Raimundo, who just completed his MLS career, I think he's played over 400 games. Well, played in yeah. Utah. Yeah. Um, complete contrast of a Tim Howard. You know, Tim didn't have the ideal profile, or Nick, I should say, didn't have the ideal profile of a goalkeeper. I mean, he's probably 5'10 at most. Right. Um, so he wasn't impressive physically, but his competitiveness was tenacious. His foot skills were great. You know, he could have been a field player as well as a goalkeeper. And he was just an extremely competitive uh, individual. Brad Friedel, I think, was one of the most complete American goalkeepers we've ever produced. He ticked off a lot of a lot of boxes and uh, very uh, tenacious. Zach Thornton who, and Tony Miola, who I trained both at the Metro Stars and today they're the Red Bulls. Tony Miola was really the first high-profile high goalkeeper that this country's produced. His presence was amazing. His communication was terrific. Uh, good composure. Zach Thornton was just one of the best athletes that I've ever trained. Just amazing. He was an All-American lacrosse player, had such power. I brought him to Portugal for Befica, and they've never seen an athlete so big, so strong, and be so agile. Um, in, in Europe, I worked with Victor Bahia. He was number one in Europe. He was in the top six in the world. His class, there's some people that are just, you know, born to be stars, and he was born... Uh, to be a star. He could have also chosen to play any sport and have been a world-class uh, athlete. Uh, 
his biggest trait I thought was his composure and his intellect. You know, if, if a fire occurred right now in my home and we were having lunch, I'd sprint out of my home. He'd finish his lunch, he'd tuck in his chair, and then he would just gently walk out and wouldn't, you know, uh, have any, any, um, any injuries as a result of the fire. He was a type of guy that when he gave up a bad goal, nobody criticized him because he looked good giving up uh, a bad goal. Um, one of the best that I worked with is someone that your goalkeepers won't know, and that's um, Ali Reza Beiravan, the World Cup goalkeeper who saved Ronaldo's penalty kick in Russia. Uh, he was a six foot five athlete who could move like a five foot six. And that's rare to find somebody that athletic and that big and be so explosive like a, like a smaller goalkeeper. You know, when you combine those two factors, then you have something very special. So I thought he was certainly one of the most special goalkeepers uh, that I've trained. Cool. And uh, there was also some female goalkeepers as well. Kim Maslin, who played for the U.S. national team and played in the World Cup. She was, uh, she was awesome as well. She was a pioneer, uh, great determination. So it goes on and on and on. Devin, where are you? Right here, I got one. Uh, there so, you go. Uh, I think one of the biggest things I struggle in as playing goalkeeper are corner kicks and like the high balls going up, having confidence going up and getting the ball when the box yeah. is crowded. Yeah. So, what are the ways that I can like work on that? Again, very, very good question. You know, I could put any athlete in goal and we could shoot at them, and somehow, some way, they're able to keep the ball out of the net. And that's just based on their athleticism and their instincts. But really, to be a goalkeeper, to perform the art of goalkeeping, it's much more than just reactions. You have to think. You have to make decisions. And a corner kick is one of those scenarios where you need to make decisions. And it's not just athlete. Do I come? Do I stay? Do I catch? Do I box? Do I position my players? The first thing, Devin, on the uh, corner kicks that you need to re recognize is the shooter, the taker of the corner kick. Are they right-footed? Are they left-footed? If they're taking the corner kick from your left side and they're right-footed, more than likely, Devin, it's going to be an outswinger. Your position is going to be different. If they're a left-footed uh, taker, more than likely it's going to be an in-swinger. Your position is different. When it's a left-footed player, you have to get more central in goal because the ball is going to be bending in towards you. If it's a right-foot kicker, it's going to be bending away, and now you get three-quarters of the distance off of the first post. So number one, who's taking it and wh which um, foot uh, striking the ball with? And then it's how you plant your pieces, your players. Uh, some, most put a player on the first post. Also, you have the option of pushing, uh, putting a player on the second post, and you should do that if you find that crosses or corner kicks are not your strength and you need as much support as you possibly can. When you do come for the ball, those two players should pinch into the goal, and now they become goalkeepers in case you've misjudged the ball. I'd like to put a, a player on the corner of the six-yard box for those low-driven balls that I can't get to. And then the other player that I'd like to mark zone is a player beyond the second post. And that is the most difficult space for a goalkeeper to manage because you have to move backwards in order to play that ball. Uh, so in terms of, and then, and then the rest becomes man to man and all depends on the philosophy of your head coach and how they, uh, they want to mark. The most annoying thing about corner kicks as well is when they place a player in front of you, right, Devin? Yeah. You know that, I mean, that really prevents your mobility. How do you play that? Most goalkeepers place, either they handle them themselves or they put a field player behind that field player, you know, I'd like to put the player in front of 
the op opposing field player because where that player is going to hurt me is space in front of him rather than behind him. So I want to prevent his pathway from approaching the ball because he could be making that run to the near post to give that, um, that flick back. Yeah. If there's hesitation, if there's doubt, Devin, you stay in goal. At the end of the day, the ball has to come to you. The ball has to come to your goal in order for them to score. If you have any doubt, don't go look for the game. Don't go fish for it. But once you decide to go, you go at 100%. And then from there, if it's a complicated environment, then you're looking to box the ball. Boxing, what you want to achieve from that is you want height, distance, and width. The further the ball goes away from your goal, and the higher the ball is, the more time you have to recover back into your goal. The wider it gets, if your team loses possession, the smaller the shooting angle the opposition has on your goal. The ultimate, the ultimate box is when you add accuracy in there. But if you can focus on the height, distance, and width, you've done, you've done a great job. And don't forget that real strong uh, goalkeeping call. And you have to practice these scenarios. Training goalkeepers on an isolated island separate from the team has some merit. But for you, Devin, to fully maximize your potential, you have to get into goal where the coach is creating functional activities that you're going to be dealing with in a game. Make sense? Yep, thank you. You're welcome. Cool. I'm going to follow up with one final question, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so what is the best way or what's a method a goalkeeper can take coming back from injuries? Um, goalkeepers on injuries, you know, we're not quite like field players where if the injury impacts not being able to make a certain save, right? A field player can get away with coming back maybe a little bit early from injuries where a goalkeeper, it's, it's quite a bit different um, aspect for us. So as a goalkeeper takes on injuries, what's, what are some things for them to focus on, especially mentality-wise coming back into the game? Yeah. You know, first of all, we only have one body and we'll never get another one. This is it. It's what you have. So it's precious. You have to respect it. It's your temple. Young goalkeepers, you need to be cautious in coming back too early. Don't come back until you're ready. Oftentimes, it's not just the physical aspect, but it's the psychological aspect. You know, um, do you still have the bravery and the courage to attack players one-on-one? -on -one? Maybe you injured yourself in a one situation, and now you're getting back a bit too early and you're hesitating and there's some doubt. Make sure when you back that you don't come back directly into the game, but you come back through progression, through mythology during training. You know, we have great advancements now in technology in terms of recovery, you know, and it's extremely important that you come back when you're ready, your body feels ready and your mind feels ready. If you come back prematurely, there could be a major setback and it could do more harm than good. So above all, be patient. You know, understand that you're going to have a long career and if you recover properly the first time, that has a tendency of not coming back. But if you do not recover properly, eventually as you get older, that injury could come back and haunt you. So make sure that it's taken care of properly as difficult as it is i mean we all love to play we train so hard and we make these commitments and we sacrifice so much so that we can demonstrate our skills in a game your time will come stay prepared work hard and your time will come awesome well dan we appreciate you coming on and being with us today and all your information you shared with us Thank you. It's my pleasure, and I wish all you guys the best of uh, success. Stay safe. Stay strong. Work on your short-term and long-term goals. What a great opportunity to really do some deep reflection and analysis on what you hope to achieve and how you intend to get there. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Hopefully we'll Thank see you. Guys.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Take care. Be good. Ciao.